A European Cup final winner in Paris three years ago. Now can he score another from the penalty spot? Left footed, strikes it, he scored! Alan Kennedy has won the European Cup for Liverpool again! The success story continues. New records are created as the Liverpool Roadshow goes on and on. Two major trophies a year have become rather commonplace at Anfield. At the start of the 83-84 season, Joe Fagan took over as manager. Perhaps with the attitude, well, why not make it three? And indeed, that's what happened. Even those who thought they'd seen it all before had to marvel at their own success. Phil Neal, who won his record seventh championship medal and set Liverpool on their way to a third European Cup victory. I don't think I appreciate it. I'm sure that uh, I won't do until I actually kind of finish playing, Clive, that really what you accomplish. It's like climbing Everest three times in a year. Out to Lee on the right-hand side, midway inside the Roma half of the field. Johnston curled him with the right foot towards the far post. Ronnie Whelan arriving, Tancredi made a bit of a meal of it. It's not cleared yet by Bonetti. Phil Neal with a chance, he scored! Phil Neal has put Liverpool in front. A glorious early tonic for the Reds. And Neal, who won the match in 77 with that cool penalty, somehow popped up there on the edge of the six-yard box as Tancredi, the goalkeeper, flapped it across. It bounced down into the path of Phil Neal, who, with 14 minutes gone, plants Liverpool's foot firmly on the road to an unparalleled treble. Yes, three major trophies in one season. The real drama in Rome comes later. First of all, at what stage did the players start believing that the treble was a realistic possibility? Once you clinch one, uh, that's when it, the ball really starts to roll. Um, it gives the boys a lot of confidence and uh, I think once that, that narrow win over Everton in the Milk Cup was, uh, was clinched, then uh, obviously the boys dug in their heels and thought, right, we like that, we'll go for another one now and uh, I think that's when the the stall was set. Was there something about this group of players though that got them through to win three where perhaps in the past one or two Liverpool sides have just fallen at the last hurdle? Yeah, it's <laughs> get, football's a game where you can go out of two or three competitions very quickly Clive. Um, I don't know, they, they, they still have the same good attitude here that they've had over the years, it's just that uh, maybe the ball ran for us a little kindly uh, towards the end there when uh, we had a few injuries and whatever, we had to dig in and we clinched a few uh, narrow uh, wins at home when uh, we didn't really play so well. And now you're the man in charge of it all on the field? Well, yeah, on the field, and that's tossing the coin, is it, Clive? <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, hopefully I can uh, carry on where Graham left off. Now Dalglish, Neil again joining in intelligently. Sooners just outside the penalty area, left-footed shot, oh, it's there! Graham Sooners, an astonishing volley with his left foot, strikes first blood for Liverpool. He didn't control it at the first attempt, but he smacked it in with his left foot at the second. Caught Neville South all unawares. And with 21 minutes gone, Graham Sooners, the man with dreams of lifting the Milk Cup later tonight, is the man who plants Liverpool's foot firmly on the winning way. Oh, oh, oh. Shaking hands with Jack Dunnett, the Football League president, and clearing the stage for Graeme Souness to be presented with the new Cannon League Championship trophy, paraded to the cop. My word, they've seen some silverware in the last 10 years. 23 major trophies Liverpool have won in that period. The first side for almost 30, 50 years to win three championships in a row. And Graeme Souness hands the trophy to Joe Fagan. What a year it's been for him. In the we play the together, game. we just can't be beat Shout no surrender, don't mention defeat The long road to glory is trodden by few There's no turning back, we're winning for you oh, 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 oh. As every season draws to a close, the same old question arises What's the secret at Anfield? Why are Liverpool such a cut above the rest? When he joined the club in the summer of 83, Michael Robinson was anxious to find out himself. Twelve months later, he'd three medals to be proud of. 
but had he discovered that elusive secret? I think Liverpool's secret is that there's no secret. It's just so basic and um, just honest hard work. No frills and uh, simplicity itself is really the secret. Was that different from other clubs that you'd been at? Well, Vass is different because everybody, I say, is searching for this secret, this secret method that's going to make their team special. And as I say, the secret is that there's no secret. It's just honest hard work and simplicity. Now, what about the appetite for football on Merseyside? What were your impressions, for instance, of when Everton and Liverpool came together at Wembley? Well, Wembley's always a, a special occasion for, for no matter what two teams get there. But for a city that's passionate as, about football as Liverpool is, I mean, uh, yes, it was a special occasion. And um, there's people so dedicated, like... You know, with the staff, the boss, and, and Ronnie Moran especially, and, and Roy Evans. I mean, uh, their life's football, and they literally give their life to the club. And it's just marvellous to see it come off for them as well. Twelve goals from Robinson, twelve more from Dalgleish. But there was never any doubt who would end up the number one hitman. The short one, but it's pumped in towards the near post. Johnson with a good header on, brilliant save by Hodge. Rush, 1-0. Typical opportunism for Ian Rush. He just can't stop scoring goals. Joe Fagan voted for Graham Souness as his man of the season. Everyone else went for Ian Rush. His fellow professionals, the football writers, both elected him Footballer of the Year because of his uncanny ability to supply in abundance football's most important commodity. And conditions are getting noticeably worse in my opinion. Out to the right-hand side. Graham Souness, right-hand touchline, midway inside the Villa half. That's a useful cross in towards Nickel. Turned on. Ian Rush will try a volley. Oh, it's an absolute beauty. 2-1 to Liverpool. And Ian Rush won't score a better goal than that. A cracking left-footed volley as the cross by Souness from the right-hand side. Maybe took a flick off the head of Steve Nickel and fell to Rush almost at waist height. And he just stepped back, had a good look at it and cracked it in with the outside of his left foot. Nigel Spick. Didn't even know it had happened. Ian, 83-84 was a remarkable season for you. Uh, yeah. Did you ever expect it to be as quite as successful as it was? No, I never expected it to be like that because I um, didn't ex expect to score as many goals as I did and twin tro three trophies is um, just rounded it up. It's being very modest because you forgot to mention Footballer of the Year twice. <laughs> yeah, um, I think that's every player's dream, really, to w win the Footballer of the Year, really, and to win that, um, I just can't believe it, really, and to win from the writers as well is but I think um, more what I respect more is from the fellow professionals uh, I, I, oh, I prefer to win that than from the writers all these accolades seem a hell of a long way from Sealand Road Chester where you began your career yeah, um, I seem to have won everything last year but, but, um, say Chester had an awful season so um, I have come on a lot really and Chester have gone down a bit but I still look for the results and I think they'll do quite well this year were you always a goal scorer from the very early days when you started playing football? Yeah, I've always scored goals, really. Uh, even when I was 11, I scored 72 in one season, so I'm looking to beat that now. Really. <laughs> but um, I've always scored goals, really, and it's just like come natural, really. Do you set yourself targets? No, I don't set myself targets. I just want... The only target I set for Liverpool is to play in every game and hope that Liverpool win at something at the end of the season. And if I've done that, I think I've done quite well. I think one of the things which you succeeded in doing last season <coughs> was exploding the myth that you can't head the ball. Yeah, um, I still can't head the ball, really, but uh, I seem to... The goals in my head just seem to be going in. I scored 12 last year in my head and just can't believe it, really. I think that was the main thing why I scored so many goals last year. I scored 12 in my head, where the previous season before I've only been scoring two and three, like, so... Um, it has come on a lot, but I still think I've got a lot more to improve. David Hodgson supporting him just behind. Got a chance to run now the full back and cross. Hodgson edge of the penalty area. Chipped in. Ian Rush, 1-0 to Liverpool. Just the start they needed. Hodgson back in the side, provided the cross. Ian Rush, well, we used to say rare-headed goals, but they're becoming ever more common. Number 31 of the season, and it could just push Liverpool on towards Wembley. Are there goals that, that really stand out in your memory when you look back to the 83-84 season? I think the one against Dino Bucharest, really. Um, That's the first one? Yeah, the first one, really, because I think what we needed to do was score a goal, and you know, uh, their heads went down when we did, so to get us, you know, really, what it did, it was got us to the final, really. Whelan, Johnston, Rush and Dalgleish all inside the 18-yard box. Phil Neal is there for the short one. Sammy Lee, who took a little bit of a blow there from Marine as he cleared for the corner, will take the corner on the right-hand side. 
curled in towards the far post. A little bit too far for Will in that time. Headed clear by Dragnia. Back in there by Sunis. Here's Rush inside the penalty area. Great chance for Ian Rush. Chip to the far post. He scored! Ian Rush with an absolutely vital goal for Liverpool, which puts them firmly on the way back to Rome. Ten minutes gone. And Ian Rush's 100th goal for Liverpool could well be the most crucial that he's ever scored. Of course, there was a header, a very valuable header in Bill Bow as well, which seemed to take about five minutes to cross the line. Which is where yeah. I was <laughs> yeah, the, the, that was because I can't head the ball, really. But uh, <laughs> that was most probably our hardest game in the European Cup before the final, really, because um, they come here, defended well. And what they tried to do over there was just try and sneak a goal, but we managed to get that. And, they were most probably our most difficult opponents in the European Cup. It's about 15 yards inside the Bilbao half. Soon as takes it short, two hands. Just drifting forward again. Pitched into the corner for Alan Kennedy on a run. Down by the corner flag. Turns inside Urquiaga. Now in towards the edge of the penalty area. In towards Ian Rush with a downward header. Yes! Ian Rush makes it 1 0 for Liverpool. Brilliant header. Following up his goal scoring feats against Luton on Saturday. With a goal even more valuable. Lovely cross by Alan Kennedy. He turned inside Ukiaga and delivered it perfectly onto the head of Rush with the right foot. And Ian Rush with as correct a header as you could ever hope to see in any coaching manual. He got above it, directed it down past the goalkeeper and it bounced up into the roof of the net. Ian Rush scored his 11th goal of the season. And of course in one match you actually succeeded in getting five goals. That was against Luton. Yeah, um, I wasn't going. I remember, all I remember is that um, I wasn't going to play before the game, and the manager asked me to play, and so I said yeah. And I just went out, and everything I seen to it, and just seems I think he only had five touches and uh, scored five goals, really. So um, I couldn't do nothing wrong that day, and no, I was really pleased. Kennedy back to Hansen, into Ian Rush, poked on again. Graham Sooners saved by Seely. Rush surely, yes. Five for Ian Rush and six for Liverpool. And Ian Rush rounds off a truly remarkable afternoon for him by scoring his 50th league goal for Liverpool. He's blasted one in on the volley, he's headed one, he's taken three opportunist goals, and really this is an all-round marksman of the very highest order. The goals of Ian Rush, which during the summer prompted the Spanish giants Barcelona to consider a bid of around £5 million. Then the Italian club Napoli put in excess of four million on the table. Liverpool turned them down. I wouldn't like to leave Liverpool, but when someone comes in like that, um, you got to think twice and see. So, uh, it's very disappointing for them from the players' point of view, and uh, I don't, I don't like it really like that. But um, it's the way uh, things are run, and you just got to accept that now. And I've got to accept that I'm at Liverpool now, and I've. I've got to go out there now this season and if I have a bad season or something, people might want to not want to know me, but I've got to go out. I've got um, something to do now, so um, the incentive anyway to do well this year. I mean, what, what, wherever you whatever you were to do at Liverpool, you, you couldn't possibly better the, the sort of the financial uh, aspect of that move, could you? No, you couldn't, because um, I think you're talking telephone numbers, what not they were doing, and um, you just can't do nothing about Liverpool, can't do nothing about it, but. Um, Say I've been secure for life now and I'm only 22, but um, I've got to work for the next few years to try and get that offer again. And if it comes up again, maybe things might change. But um, say um, Liverpool could never match that really, but you can see their point of view. And um, no, Liverpool, I've got a good, good contract at Liverpool anyway, so I've just got to keep going. Four and a half million pounds. <laughs> it's mind boggling, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's mind boggling, yeah, but I say. Um, it's over with now and I just like to forget it now really and get on with me with the game. Are you confident that you'll be able to keep scoring goals at the rate that you have been doing? Yeah, I still think uh, I can score goals if I'm with the right team and I still think I'll appeal out the right team in Britain and they've got the best players in Britain so I don't see no reason why I should stop scoring now. Right footed, beats the goalkeeper and a memorable hat-trick for Ian Rush. Two goals in the closing three minutes of the first half. Now another ten minutes into the second. His goal-scoring feats go on and on. 30 in the league this season. No player has done that in the first division since Bob Latchford for Everton. And a standing ovation all round the ground because he's now equaled Roger Hunt's league goal-scoring record in a season for Liverpool since the war. Coming up next, the glory that was Rome. Francesco Graziani, another Italian World Cup star, picks up the ball, kisses it, hopefully, and prepares to take the penalty. 
in the knowledge that he must score to keep Roma on terms. What can Grobler produce? Right footed, over the crossbar! Oh, Liverpool are one kick away! time the start of the 1984 European Cup final and here in the Olympic Stadium it favors Liverpool versus the world Falcao trying his luck with a long shot from the halfway line which Grobler feels comfortably and bowls out to Mark Lawrenson there have been 10 previous instances of a major European club final being staged in the home country of one of the competing clubs and only once have the visitors gone home with a trophy that was in the very first European Cup final back in 1956 when Real Madrid beat the French champions Reims in Paris. So the odds stacked against Liverpool. Liverpool, the 1984 European Cup final. Liverpool just 90 minutes away from an unprecedented triple success. But as it turned out, it took a lot longer than that. The Reds had returned to the eternal city of Rome, the scene of their greatest triumph seven years earlier when they overcame the threat of Borussia Mönchengladbach. But this was another story. Their opponents were AS Roma, playing in front of their own partisan and highly volatile supporters. Roma had been virtually invincible in the Olympic Stadium, and few people outside Merseyside fancied Liverpool's chances. But the road to Rome had proved Liverpool could stand up to the severest challenge. Minutes before the kickoff, Clive Tilsley summed up the mood by recalling their route to the final. The Radio City outside broadcast team were at every match. The road to Rome started eight months ago in the land of fairy tales, in the sleepy Danish town of Odense, birthplace of Hans Christian Andersen. And then Johnson on the left-hand side, edge of the penalty area, trying to turn away from his marker, squeezes it back. Michael Robinson with a left-footed shot, blocked by Utrecht, Dalglish, 1-0. Liverpool take the lead. Kenny Dalglish edges closer to that record number of goals for Britain in the European Cup. Kenny Dalglish's single away goal settled the first leg and the masterful Scott used the return to break Dennis Law's European Cup goal scoring record as Michael Robinson opened his club account. So a free kick 10 yards outside the penalty area. Sammy Lee will have the first run at it, blasts it with the right foot, deflected away by Alan Nielsen as far as Dalglish. Alan Kennedy overlapping on the left hand side, low cross, rush, Robinson, he's got it! Michael Robinson gets off the mark for Liverpool. 15 minutes gone, Alan Kennedy was who popped up on the left-hand side to make it possible. Although Ian Rush couldn't convert the first chance, Robinson smartly poked it in from about eight yards. And that will take a whole big weight off his mind. Robinson got two of Liverpool's five that night, and Denmark's cruel win over England in between the two games had at least been partially avenged, and Liverpool were on the way. Atención, final, final, final del partido, final del partido, lo ha señalado el señor... The message of hope was broadcast to Northern Spain at the end of 90 minutes of goalless frustration for Liverpool against Athletic Bilbao at Anfield in round two. Anthony Goyka chair, the man who'd cut Diego Maradona in half, helped spread a suffocating defensive blanket over the Reds, who answered though with a faultless display in the Lions' Den at the San Mamés Stadium two weeks later. It's about 15 yards inside the Bilbao half. Soon as takes it short, two hands, just drifting forward again. Pitched into the corner for Alan Kennedy on a run. Down by the corner flag. Turns inside Urquiaga. Now in towards the edge of the penalty area. In towards Ian Rush with a downward header. Yes! Ian Rush makes it 1 0 for Liverpool. Brilliant header. Following up his goal scoring feats against Luton on Saturday. With a goal even more valuable. Lovely cross by Alan Kennedy. He turned inside Urquiaga and delivered it perfectly onto the head of Rush with the right foot. 
and Ian Rush with as correct a header as you could ever hope to see in any coaching manual. He got above it, directed it down past the goalkeeper, and it bounced up into the roof of the net. Graham Sooners, the man hoping to lift the cup tonight, still insists that was Liverpool's best display of the season. The game in Bilbao set two trends for the road to Rome. Firstly, Liverpool's away day ticket to the final with all of their best football coming on foreign soil. And secondly, the priceless opportunism of Ian Rush, who'd never been particularly happy with his European striking rate up until then. In March, Benfica became his second victims. Kennedy making the outside burst. He's got into a good crossing position here as Alan Kennedy. Useful one in towards the far post. Rush with the header, 1-0. Oh yes, that is exactly what Liverpool needed. Alan Kennedy's cross from the left-hand side. Bento, the little goalkeeper, caught in no man's land. And Ian Rush strikes first blood for Liverpool. And how important a goal that may be. It was all Liverpool could muster at Anfield, though. And again, they left themselves a mountain to climb in Lisbon Stadium of Light, where no team had beaten Benfica in Europe since Liverpool's previous visit in 78. But the return trip was to be a memorable one. We've had eight minutes of play. Plays it back towards Phil Neal, just outside the penalty area. Controls it under pressure. Finds Lee again on the right-hand side. A good crossing position. Killed into Ronnie Whelan. It's there! Ronnie Whelan has scored for Liverpool. The perfect curly tonic provided by the head of Ronnie Whelan. A wicked curling cross from Sammy Lee. And Whelan still into space six yards out. Bento, the tiny goalkeeper, drops on it, but it let it roll under his body. And Ronnie Whelan has given Liverpool a dream start in the Stadium of Light. Here is Ian Rush, just outside the penalty area. Back square to Dalglish again. Helps on to Craig Johnston inside the penalty area. Right footy shot, 2-0. Craig Johnston surely sends Liverpool to the semi-final. A blistering shot with his right foot. After a carefully engineered break involving Ian Rush and Kenny Dalglish. And Liverpool have stormed Lisbon tonight in the opening half-hour. They scored two crucial away goals. And surely it's enough. Benfica will have no answer to this, I'm sure. Douglas holds the ball, edge of the penalty area. Looks up, he's got Johnston behind him. Strokes it back, though, to Ronnie Whelan. He controls it and plays it further back to Alan Kennedy, midway inside the Benfica half. Johnston with a sweet little back heel. He's released Douglas into the corner on the left-hand side. Crossed in deep with the left foot. Rush with a header, 3-1. Ian Rush puts the final nail in Benfica's coffin. Delightful header from Kenny Dalglish's cross from the left-hand side. The revival is over, and Liverpool are through to the European Cup semi-finals. It would take a miracle to stop them now. And here come Russian Dalglish on the break once more. Dalglish midway inside the Benfica half. Whelan going on outside him, just on the edge of the penalty area. He's first past Pietra. Oh, and he slipped it in beautifully at the near post. Roddy Whelan scores his second of the night. And Liverpool are strolling into the semi-finals. Past the quarter-final stage where they'd fallen in each of the two previous seasons, Liverpool steered clear of Roma and Dundee United in the semi-final draw. Dinamo Bucharest were next, conquerors of reigning champions Hamburg, and a team who were to show an uncompromising desire to get to the final. It certainly has the makings of a rather explosive match now. No let up to these cynical challenges from the Dinamo defenders. Kennedy takes the free kick early. Lee arriving with a header. He scored. Oh, Sammy Lee, the smallest man on the field, has headed Liverpool in front on the first big step along the way back to Rome. That was the only goal of a first leg littered with cynical challenges by the tough Romanians. But with one of their number lying in Walton Hospital with a broken jaw, Dinamo returned home to fuel a propaganda war which painted Liverpool in the role of villains when they travelled to Bucharest two weeks later for another triumph of epic proportions triggered by what Ian Rush believes to be one of the best three goals he's ever scored. Whelan, Johnston, Rush and Dalglish all inside the 18-yard box. Phil Neal is there for the short one. Sammy Lee, who took a little bit of a blow there from Marine as he cleared for the corner, will take the corner on the right-hand side. Curled in towards the far post. A little bit too far for Will in that time. Headed cleared by Dragnia. Back in there by Sunis. Here's Rush inside the penalty area. Great chance for Ian Rush. Chip to the far post. He scored! Ian Rush with an absolutely vital goal for Liverpool, which puts them firmly on the way back to Rome. Ten minutes gone. 
And Ian Rush's 100th goal for Liverpool could well be the most crucial that he's ever scored. It was brilliantly executed inside the penalty area. A lovely turn away from the defender which made the space. And when Mararu came quickly off his line, Rush just chipped it over him into the far corner of the goal. Delagnia with the ball down, just kept in play by Tuku, but only for Sammy Lee to come forward for Liverpool. Skin Stanescu down the right-hand side, drives in an early ball. Ronnie Whelan's got forward in support. Five yards outside the penalty area. Whelan holding it, has Nickel behind him. He's gone on himself, curls it in low. Ian Rush trying to make something of a mistake. Left-footed shot, it's there! Ian Rush surely ties up Liverpool's place in the final to cap a quite magnificent individual performance. Five minutes left to play, and Ian Rush the golden goal scorer has come up with another one and Liverpool are going back to Rome. The only survivor from Liverpool's 1977 team which won in Rome was Phil Neal. I knew it was going to be harder this time uh, around Clive. Uh, I didn't think we would uh, accomplish what we did. Uh, at the back of my mind I had doubts that uh, going into the lion's den so to speak but I tell you what, it was still as rewarding as the first time. Because the 1977 victory over Mönchengladbach was a great night, which perhaps some of the younger Liverpool fans don't fully appreciate what that meant to the club at the time. No, I think... <laughs> see, people don't realise that it takes two years to win the European Cup, and uh, <laughs> to fail at the last hurdle uh, must be a terrible thing, uh, because you strive for two years to win that. First to win the league, and then obviously to win the the competition itself, but uh, I'd say that that first victory was obviously great foundation and uh, as, I, as are the, the Milk Cup victories over the latter years, the last few years, for the, in the way of the experience of the young lads, because I mentioned experience, I meant Kenny and maybe Howard Hansen and, and such like, but the, the younger players over the last three or four years have won so much that they are really experienced players with young, young heads, so to speak. And for the youngsters listening, can you describe what it means to score a goal in a European Cup final? You've done it twice now. <laughs> Three times with the penalty. Right, yeah. Uh, <laughs> is there a feeling? A yeah, there is. Yeah, there is a very special feeling. Um, we realised that, um, I think we realised that, that Ian was going to be picked up very tightly, as was Kenny going to be, and, and maybe Graham too. So I think we all felt that someone had to come from deep, and it, it happened to be me at the time, Clive, and I was elated, obviously. I just wish that... Uh, it could have been the winner. Out to Lee on the right-hand side. Midway inside the Roma half of the field. Johnston. Curled in with the right foot towards the far post. Ronnie with an arriving. Tancredi made a bit of a meal of it. It's not cleared yet by Bonetti. Phil Neal with a chance. He scored! Phil Neal has put Liverpool in front. A glorious early tonic for the Reds. And Neal, who won the match in 77 with that cool penalty, somehow popped up there on the edge of the six-yard box as Tancredi, the goalkeeper, flapped it across. It bounced down into the path of Phil Neal, who, with 14 minutes gone, plants Liverpool's foot firmly on the road to an unparalleled treble. They'll be happy now to go into the interval with this one-goal lead if Liverpool can just keep their concentration now for three more minutes. Di Bartolome, out to Naylor on the left-hand side, confronted by Sammy Lee, pitches one over the top, Conti in a useful position behind Phil Neal, into the dead ball line. Got in across, but Mark Lawrence and charged it down. Conti again, Prucso with a header, brilliant goal. 1-1. Roberto Prusso with a lovely flick here on the edge of the six-yard box has set Rome alight. Conti was the man who made it all possible. It was his cross from the left-hand side, curled in with the right foot of the second attempt. And a darting little run from Prusso finished off with a beautifully angled header over Bruce Grohl, who had just come a yard or two off his line, over him into the far corner of the net. And with two minutes to go to half time, we're back where we started. After 90 minutes, the score remained the same. A gruelling period of extra time, and still it stayed at one all. So for the first time, the European Cup final would be decided on penalties. Steve Nicol will take the first penalty for Liverpool. This young man who came on as substitute and has had such an impact on the game. I remember him taking a couple in a pre-season tournament in Rotterdam in the summer. He scored one and missed one there. Faced by Franco Tancredi the Roma penalty saving expert. Three out of four that he's faced this season, he has saved. And Steve Nicol, a heavy weight on young shoulders with the first penalty. Right footed, he's knocked it over the crossbar. Missed the target completely. Tried to pull it to the goalkeeper's right into the roof of the net. 
and he has set this penalty competition alight as far as the Roman fans are concerned. As you might imagine, the Italians are making a bit of a fuss about their first penalty. It's to be Agostino Di Bartolome, their regular penalty taker, and the man whose penalty settled the semi-final against Dundee United here. After Dundee had won the first leg, 2-0, Bruzzo had scored a couple. It was from the spot that Di Bartolome scored. He takes a couple of steps and blasts him, so I've been told. Now, what can Bruce Grobbler make of it? Two steps, blasts it, right-footed, he scored. Centre of the goal, Grobbler died to his right. And that is 1-0 to Roma. And Liverpool call forward their penalty expert, Phil Neal. One of only six men, indeed, the last man to score a penalty in the normal context of a European Cup final. He's in good company in that list, too. Di Stefano, Puskas, Eusebio, Mazzola, Vasovic. That crucial penalty that he scored in this stadium at the other end of the ground in 77 to win the European Cup. And this one is even more crucial. Phil Neal, who has scored from only one of the three penalties that he's taken this season, but it was the vital one at Hillsborough in the Milk Cup quarter-final. Right-footed against Tancredi. Slides it in, he scored. Phil Neal, deathly hushed around the Olympic Stadium. So, it's 1-1. And next is Bruno Conti, the explosive Italian World Cup winger who has had a very frustrating night one way or another, but whose cross led to the equalising goal scored by Roberto Pruzzo just before half-time. Looks like he'll take it left-footed. Referee Eric Fredrickson, having been to the halfway line, now runs back. Grobola waits on his line. Conti against Grobola. If the Liverpool keeper can save it, we're back where we started. Here comes the little winger. Left-footed, drills it high over the crossbar. Oh, yes. And Bruno Conti suffers the same tragic fate that befell Steve Nicholl just a couple of minutes ago. And now a skipper's row for the man who hopes to lift the European Cup. Sunis against Tancredi. Drills it with the right foot into the corner of the net. And Graham Sunis has scored for Liverpool who now lead by 2-1 to one in the penalty competition. The youngest man on the field, Ubaldo Righetti, 21 years of age, takes the next one, slides it past Bruce Grobel, is sent in the wrong way. 2-2 two -two in the penalty competition, and two each to take. And now Rush, the deadliest marksman in Europe, faces Franco Tancredi, hits it right-footed and slides it in and sends the goalkeeper the wrong way. And Ian Rush has scored, it's 3-2 to Liverpool. If it's level after each side have taken five, it goes to sudden death. Francesco Graziani, another Italian World Cup star, picks up the ball, kisses it, hopefully, and prepares to take the penalty in the knowledge that he must score to keep Roma on terms. What can Grobler produce? Right-footed, oh, with a crossbar! Oh, Liverpool are one kick away! So the outcome of two years' constant endeavour rested on one crucial penalty kick. Imagine the tension the responsibility. Phil Neal couldn't even look. I realised that Alan Kennedy uh, had got a score to win us a medal again. Uh, I couldn't look. I mean, that's that's for someone who's taken penalties and whatever like, but I just couldn't look. And uh, uh, Ronnie Whelan, uh, I got in front of Ronnie, and Ronnie was giving me a running commentary, as, as you did on the radio. <laughs> and it's Alan Kennedy, the man who scored their European Cup final winner in Paris three years ago, who has the responsibility and the chance to win the giant trophy for them once again. Now, Kennedy took some penalties in that pre-season tournament in Rotterdam back in August, and I hate to tell you this, but he missed them both. I think it was Alan Hansen, because he was lining up everybody, because uh, he obviously didn't have much confidence in me. And to be honest, uh, he's seen me take penalties before, and he was lining up who was taking number six, seven, eight and nine, <laughs> because at that particular moment, they obviously thought I was going to miss. Somebody said you actually smiled when you placed the ball and turned around to walk back. It's funny that, yeah, I was so confident um, that I would at least hit the target. And uh, I, I don't think the goalkeeper had actually touched the ball before that, because neither goalkeeper had made a save. I thought, well, if I put it in the right direction, I've got a chance of scoring. To be honest, I don't think a lot of people uh, had a lot of confidence because, uh, you know, I mean, that was my first really competitive penalty in, in uh, any type of competition, apart from pre-season friendlies. And it was only on the Monday that... Uh, we decided who was taking the penalties and I think if Kenny Dalglish had stayed on the pitch at that particular time 
he would have took the fifth penalty. But uh, the boss came up to me and said, you know, give me a, um, a confidence booster by saying, you know, you're taking the fifth penalty. But Alan Kennedy, a brave and gutsy performer, as brave and gutsy as Liverpool have produced in recent years, now has the chance to write himself into the archives of football. A European Cup final winner in Paris three years ago. Now can he score another from the penalty spot? Left-footed, strikes it, he scored! <laughs> Alan Kennedy has won the European Cup for Liverpool again! Dramatic scenes on the touchline as the Liverpool players like crazy school children celebrate. A wonderful moment for them all. And the biggest relief and the biggest smile is on the face of Steve Nicholl, the young substitute who had such a magnificent match and who had that fearful moment when he missed the first penalty. But Neil, and then Sunis, and then Rush, and now Kennedy have won the European Cup back for Liverpool. What's the feeling when you watch it again now on video? I still get nervous, but, uh, you know, it's over and done with now, and, uh, you know, it's, it's just memories now. So, Graeme Sunis follows in the footsteps of Emlyn Hughes and Phil Thompson to collect his first European Cup. Followed up the steps by Bruce Grobler, Doug Leash behind him, then Alan Hansen, Michael Robinson behind Steve Nicholl. But it's Sunis who makes his way up to the box where that giant gleaming trophy glitters under the floodlights and prepares to collect his eighth major trophy in less than two and a half years as Liverpool captain. Jack George, the acting president of UEFA, hands the European Cup to the Liverpool skipper, Graham Sunis. And the Reds are back on the top of the tree again. A unique treble. He holds that giant trophy up aloft. Flashlights flicker amongst the Liverpool fans who wave their flags and scarves in exultation. My word, they've seen some silverware in the last 10 years. 24 major trophies. But for the first time, it's Graham Sunis who holds aloft the one that it's all about. A remarkable end to a remarkable season. How do they do it? What's the secret? Wouldn't you love to know? I think Liverpool's secret is that there's no secret. Yeah.